Cougar fans, it is time. Touchdown! What a grab! It's time to raise your colors, raise your voice, and join in on the raucous roundtable about your favorite team, the BYU Cougars. 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown! It's time to tailgate. Cougar Tailgate, where BYU sports fandom lives. And here's your host, Lauren McClain. What's up, Cougar Nation? I'm Lauren McClain, and we're here to tailgate with you, doing what we do best, talking all things BYU Cougars. It's time for the Texas stretch in BYU football schedule, starting with the old WAC and Mountain West Conference foe and the 2022's national championship runner-up, TCU. The Horned Frogs are without their starting quarterback, but still have a lot of weapons despite back-to-back losses to West Virginia and Iowa State. The Cougars are seeking their first Big 12 road victory this weekend. For today's roundtable discussion, we have sports producer Hema Hemuli. What's up? What's up? And the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rebell. Hi, Greg. Hi, Lauren. Thank you, guys, so Hi, much Emma. for being here. Hi, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> so polite, everybody. It's time for our Hot Off the Grill segment. We're just going to get right into it. But before we get to our hot takes, let's talk about what Hot Off the Grill food we take right now because every good tailgate should begin and end with food. Hema, yes. what what hot off the grill food sounds so good to you right now? Oh my gosh, I like all of them. There's not really <laughs> anything I wouldn't eat. Uh, I'll, I'll be so honest. True. When people like roast the those gators, you know, no. in the tailgate before, I would eat that. You really would. I really would. You're an adventurous eater. But that's not probably not my choice. My choice would probably be like ribs or something. Okay. You would eat the gator. Man, yeah. what about you, Greg? I'm a steak guy, but yeah. uh, Italian sausage on the grill sounds pretty good mm. right now. I'm right I'm right with you. That's funny, because I said chicken sausage shish kebabs with mm. some grilled vegetables. Doesn't okay. that sound great? So any of you tailgaters out there, let's make this happen, all right? All right. Our hot off the grill question this week is, which player on offense or defense do you feel like is just heating up right now? Greg, what do you think? Chase Roberts. All right. Chase Roberts for me. Yeah, he had his career high in receiving yards in his last game, and clearly somebody Keaton Slovis is looking for, even when he's not looking for him, he yeah. finds him uh, sometimes. But uh, I think Chase is, uh, and especially in a year when, when Cody Epps hasn't been a factor and Keanu Hill isn't the factor he was last year, uh, Chase is the one of the returning three that has been as advertised. There's nothing that, well, I shouldn't say nothing, but something that makes me really happy and know that I'm in the right direction is when me and Greg Rebell are on the same page. <laughs> wow. I also said Chase Roberts. He's caught 24 passes for 358 yards, three TDs in five games. Uh, he had that come out of nowhere catch against Cincinnati where I think most of us thought it was going to be picked off and then ended up scoring a touchdown, which won the game. Of course, the incredible one had to catch against Arkansas. That could very well end up being the play of the year or catch of the year. And the Highland Utah native is only a sophomore. Yeah. And that's what I love about him. You're, you, It feels like he's been around a little bit longer than that. But, no, he's just a sophomore. So I agree with you, Greg. I think he's the one heating up right now. Emma, mm-hmm. what do you think? Uh, I'll just pick someone different. I think Marcus <laughs> McKenzie is uh, heating up. I think he's showing a, a hot start to a promising career. Um, Greg mentioned something last night on the coaches show. We had um, Max Tooley on, and Greg mentioned that Max Tooley was a special teams um, spark when he was first starting his BYU career, much like Marcus McKenzie is. So I think it's just a start. You know, he's always on special teams. He seems to be in the right place at the right time on a lot of big plays, and um, I I can't see anything – um, it's, it's a great start for when he eventually plays a position on defense or offense. Or yeah, whatever. and he gets defensive reps in the two deep in practice at corner. And when he does become a corner for BYU, um, he, he's going to be a great player there too as well. And I know Kalani yeah. said he, he wants to try and get him a few more reps in game because he's doing so well on special teams. Greg, I'm curious since you've been around the game and BYU football so long, is that a trend that you've seen? If somebody when they first come in as a freshman or a new player is starting to do really well on special teams, have you seen them progress into – a good position player later on in their career? I'm sure there are many examples of it. I think what what was interesting about uh, the Bronco era in particular was that he he was emphatic about making sure the best players do end up on special teams, even if they were already had starting roles at other places. That was one of the things that kind of mm. stood out, I think, from, from his tenure was he thought that special teams was important. He says we talk about how, how important it is, but yet we, we don't put you know some of our best players on the special teams. Um, I, I, Ziggy Ansa was, was a, a guy that you know 
when he when he burst onto the scene, it wasn't as a defensive lineman yet. It was as a special teams guy. He would just be downfield before anybody else at that size. He really jumped out. Um, and there are other guys that, uh, you know, Danny Sorensen uh, comes to mind, a great starter, but was also one of the best special teams players BYU's had, made himself into an NFL uh, player. He's uh, So there are a lot of good examples of guys that were just too good um, to, to not play on special teams because of how important it's supposed to be. If I was a punt returner and I saw Ziggy Ansah running oh at me, can you yeah. imagine? It was fun to watch because yeah. he was just so He's big, so moving so fast. fast. Yeah. yeah, he was an incredible player. Yeah. BYU and TCU have met 11 times with the Horn Frogs getting the edge in the win 6 to 5. It was a heated rivalry uh, from 87 to 2011 when both teams were part of the WAC in the Mountain West Conference. So the fan question this week is Does this week's game feel like a rekindling of an old rivalry? And do you want it to be? Let's go to some of the fan responses. Isaac Carlin on X said, I don't feel like it is because they haven't really played them that much. I mean, only playing them that many times doesn't feel like a rivalry amount of playing each other to me. Also, I don't think they should be a rivalry because they are in Texas and rivalries tend to be geographic. What do you think of that? I mean, he's got a point. Uh, I mean, I think so. I Okay, here's my position, though. Just I just... I think it should be a rivalry because the 2011 loss crushed me. <laughs> I was talking so much crap that year, and I had some really good friends that were TCU fans, and um, yeah, so that still stings, and yeah. I want to get one back. Like That's my feeling going yeah. into this week. I'm like, we got to get these guys back, and what other kind of matchups do that other than rivalries yep. where you're like thinking about it yeah. over 12 years or whatever 12 <laughs> years later i really need to win over the scene yeah at watchman underscore mike on x said i'd rather have utah i don't trust tcu i don't know what that means but there's <laughs> well, something okay. there in addition to geography which is a factor in rivalry right. familiarity is also a factor mm-hmm. and BYU's played TCU more than any other team in the Big 12 because they've yeah. been in two conferences together. I mean, right. so from that standpoint, this is the third time they've been conference yeah. colleagues. Mm-hmm. Now, they weren't really long stretches together in the WAC, and that was a quadrant, so you'd skip a quadrant. And so they were together in the WAC, though, in the quadrant days, and then the Mountain West. But they played enough games. 11 games is enough to get you know yeah. some sense of familiarity, even though it's been a number of years. The programs were annual rivals for a good long time. Um, and so it's it's the best thing BYU's got right now in the in the Big 12 is TCU because they played it more than any other any, any other team by far, um, and and so I, I like that part of it, and the fact that there are things you can remember from games that are you know the things that stick in the mind that that's also a factor as well. Um, so yeah, and I, I don't think the, the geography has come to mean less in the era mm-hmm. of realignment. It no yeah, longer means much right. of anything, and and so you're going to be together no matter how you get put together. A rival is a rival, so uh, I, I think TCU can be a good rivalry, and and uh, I, I'm excited for it to be rekindled because there are those games that I can remember from the past that meant something, uh, wins and losses. Um, yes, it's six to five. Uh, TCU. The one advantage uh, is actually a neutral field game because at home both teams are three and two against the other team. Mm-hmm. It was that one in uh, 2011 in Arlington mm-hmm. that uh, Hem is referring to at Cowboy Stadium. Was yeah. that the uh, Rayleigh Nielsen high five? Yes, it was. Yeah. How can you? And that was going to be my, my my moment that stands out. Oh really. dang oh, it! Yeah. I just though, ruined it. Even though it was a, even it. though it came in a loss, how do you ever forget <laughs> Riley Nelson high fiving an official at the goal line? You know. No one wants to know this, but it stands out to me also because my brother was at the game and he was caught picking his nose on camera <laughs> on ESPN, just Where's close that? up as can be. I was like, that is so rude. Uh, Thomas Kelly on X said, I think the old stuff is in the past. To me, a rivalry would mean need to be practicing or practically uninterrupted to count as one. If something gets kindled with TCU, I personally would want it to be about recent events, and I'd consider that as a new rivalry altogether. Yeah, well, we're looking forward to you know you know years to come of Big Twelve games that will stand out. Now, now is when things really start to get interesting, is because you're in a conference again, and everyone's pretty friendly right now. Mm-hmm. A lot of good feelings, yeah. but occasionally there will pop up a game or a quote or something will, and there will something will simmer. It'll become incendiary, and and those things will become the things we remember in years to in, in years to come. So that's what I think is great about the Big Twelve is that it it becomes a situation where where those kinds of things become long lasting again. Uh, events pop up and things get yes. said mm-hmm. and 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 penalties get committed and and penalties get missed and game winners get made and it just becomes this thing that uh, sticks in your <laughs> mind again. Yeah. It actually makes me laugh all the kumbaya singing within the Big <laughs> 12 right now. We all love each other. There's so much of that right now and I think it's just their Everyone's hanging on together because of all the conference realignment. And yeah, just give it time, though. Give it yes, time. Yes, give it time. So I like that point a lot because yeah. I, I do think it's coming. 
GC Ben Dixon on X said rivalries aren't just about hatred. There is mutual respect, even if not publicly acknowledged, and rivals provide a bar to beat. Thus, they measure success relative to each other. None of this applies to BYU and TCU, except maybe some hatred. Definitely no respect. I don't know mm, about that. I don't think that's true. I don't know if there's a lot of hatred. There was a game. There was a game in Fort Worth years ago um, in which a BYU administrator went into the stands to confiscate or tear up or get rid of some signs, some offensive signs from oh, the TCU yeah. student Whoa. fan base, as I recall. That, that, that sticks out. I remember okay. that. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. TCU never liked it too much when BYU basketball would come into their basketball arena and have all the fans and then stick around to greet all of the BYU supporters afterward and have a little gathering. And, <laughs> you know, that, that, that never sat too well with a lot of people. I, I, it's, so I, I, there are some things in regards to yes. TCU that, that I do remember. Mm. Now, things have changed. TCU's fan base has totally turned over and, and basketball, you know, kind of fills their building now. And yeah. their football stadium is so much more beautiful than it was when BYU played there last. Um, in 2012, they completed that renovation that was 142 million dollar it's basically a new stadium it's gorgeous now um and so you know they, they've done a lot of things that show they are p5 not only forget the fact that they've played yeah. in all these you know big time bowl games yeah. and were the national championship last year this is a big time program now it's going to look a lot different than it did the last time byu and tcu played absolutely on instagram jesse cottom said i don't have memories of their history but i think it'd be cool i wish we could also have a rivalry with baylor with christian values from both uh bryson webster it it doesn't yet feel like rivalry, but would love it to turn into a rivalry again. So I think the message here is maybe the 35-plus crowd <laughs> think it's, it feels like a rekindling Ouch. of a yeah. rivalry. I mean, that's kind of what it what it feels like, yeah. right? A little bit. So uh, I should have started with, who's Riley Nelson? Oh, <laughs> Yeah, Dang Riley it. Nelson. Who? I doesn't remember. Uh, well, Greg. If you don't, yeah, well then you may not know who Justin Lutgerot is either, <laughs> and that's another one of my no. big memories from this rivalry. But anyway, okay, well tell me that because I who well was Justin Lutgerot uh, was a BYU linebacker that uh, knocked the ball out in the overtime game. TCU beat BYU fifty-one to fifty. I think it was back in 05, 05, 06. Um John and, Beck. Uh, it was, yeah, it was it, it was Bron- I think it was Broncos' first year, fifty one fifty, so okay. the 05 game. Um, and TCU was going into the end zone to score in overtime, and Justin Lutgerot knocked the ball out, shy of the goal line. At least that's what I thought live. But there wasn't a great camera angle to show on the replay, and so they let the play stand, as I recall, and it was a big thing at the time. But I thought that Justin Lutgerot made the game-winning play, mm. um, but it didn't stand that way. It, it ended up being... Um, uh, he judged on the field or stood or whatever the case may be, and, and, and the score stood. Um, but Justin Luke wrote, maybe what I thought was a game-winning play, and then ended up BYU losing that game 51-50 in overtime. Hema, yeah. you, you mentioned the 2011 game, but what stands yeah. out to you to the rivalry? Well, okay, I mean, so mo- most of my memories, just thinking about it, comes from that 2011 game because literally, okay, I'll show you my favorite moment. Um, when uh, J.D. Falslev returned the, the punt for a touchdown, Mm-hmm. I was going crazy in a Chili's in Bountiful, Utah, in front of my TCU friends, and um, obviously we're still losing. But I thought that that momentum, I was like, we have a chance, we're going to come back. It's we have the momentum and all that stuff. Um, and so it was heart crushing when when it didn't turn out that mm-hmm. way. But um, you know, the best memories are made when you're actually like you're cheering and these big plays are made. And you feel that hope and that sensation of like euphoria for the time. And yeah. Anyways, those that's that's my memories. This 2011 game and um, yeah, like I said, rivalries. You just got to get one back. You know? Yeah. So I, it feels like a rivalry to me. So I so, like that. Something else that stands out to me from these TCU games uh, is that in, in in a lot of the recent ones, TCU has been a ranked team. They, they've been you know one of the yes. best teams in the country mm-hmm. at that time. And BYU never really found itself in the same spot. We kind of felt like a turning of the tide where TCU went from kind of an also-ran program to becoming a power. And it was happening at the tail end of those Mountain West years. And and so then we saw TCU under Andy Dalton, um, Gary Patterson become something you know pretty special. And they just carried it on to their P5 era. And so T- TCU got really good at about that time. It uh, Kind of a broad stroke memory for me about TCU is it does seem like when BYU had something good going – TCU always crushed it. That just was, that's like my well, memory. BYU, yeah, right. BYU had that yeah. great start to the yes. season, six, seven, and zero. Went down to Fort Worth and just got smoked. And they got smoked. Yeah. And that was the Andy Dalton yeah. era, right? Ugh, and yeah. I, he was unstoppable in that game. I remember. Yeah. TCU is also only selling tickets to the BYU game as as part of a keep it purple plan that includes tickets to the Texas matchup with no option to resell. BYU fans are known to have an amazing showing at away games, but. 
this initiative may prevent that from happening. How do you guys think that's going to impact the game, if at all? Well, Kal- what Kalani said on our show last night, right, that BYU yeah. fans will find a way. Yeah, they'll find yeah. a way. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we've seen it in the past, like whether it's second market <laughs> yeah. tickets or whatever. Um, they'll, they'll find a way to get there, and I think that'll – any blue in the stands will an- will animate the players. Will will make them feel at home. I think they're they're used to you know being in the from coming off of Independence. They're used to hostile environments, going to random places, and um, any any sign of blue is will be good for the team. And so you they're, know they're going to be making deals with the the TCU fans. Like, listen, if you give me your BYU ticket, then you know <laughs> yeah, I, we'll you're, find you're a right. They're they going to find. They'll a way. get there. But TCU, you know, apply, you know, credit the TCU for doing things within their power to try and keep their stadium purple. Yeah, <laughs> mm-hmm. I love it. Okay, it's time for our segment, buy or sell, where we talk about some specific topics that have to do with BYU, and you tell me if you're going to buy it or sell it. First one is BYU scores thirty points. Against TCU, Greg, are you buying it or selling it? Well, if they do, they're probably going to win. <laughs> uh, in the Kalani era, I think the number is now forty-one and three, the win-loss record when they get to thirty. Okay. Um, they are averaging thirty-one wow. a game this year. Um, they haven't scored thirty in every game, but they are averaging thirty-one a game. I think if they get to thirty, they can expect to win the game. Uh, the question is, will they? TCU is averaging, you know, twenty-two and change or twenty-one, I think, right now. Uh, it's tough to score on this team. They've allowed only five offensive touchdowns. In, or rather, they've allowed only eight offensive touchdowns in the last five games. Mm. So they're averaging less than two touchdowns per game. So I, I think 30 is a hard ask. Uh, if they were to get to 30, I think they're going to win the game. But uh, that's that's that. TCU is is a a, a formidable defense. Uh, they're not knock you out numbers like they have been historically, but they're good enough right now. And again, that number right there, that that eight touchdowns in five games, that's that's pretty yeah. substantial. Emma, what do you think? You buying um, it or selling it? I'm gonna buy it. Okay, uh, I'm not as analytical or intelligent as Greg. <laughs> not I, I, it's just not from what side. I see, you know, and watching them uh, against Iowa State, I'm like, man, we might be able to put numbers on these guys. And uh, <laughs> you know, I think I, I'm a big believer in the old Bronco Mendenhall rule: first 24 wins the game. Right? Um, I think BYU can do it, so I'm gonna buy it. I'm gonna buy it too. BYU has won the turnover margin in, in its four wins. And now I'm at the point now where I really trust the defense to get turnovers and to make stops and to give BYU some great um, field position. And I think that's been a bright spot in in BYU's four wins. And I think if they can do that again, and they've been scoring a lot of points off of that as well. So I think they can do it. BYU's strength is defense right now. What the offense yeah. is doing is making the most of what it gets. <laughs> um, they're not putting up eye-popping numbers. In fact, they're they're you know they're putting up these games of under 300 yards in offense and winning these games. But they're scoring points without a ton of offense. Yeah. Um, they're opportunistic. They're a great red zone team. When they get in there, they they, they 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 tend to score. They're not tossing the ball away a lot. The Kansas game, with the exception. So if you're not an overpowering offense, you've got to do the other things really well. And that's what BYU yeah. is doing right now. Sonny Dyke said it. They're just doing. They're doing things it takes to win a football game, and mm-hmm. that's why they're four and one, because if, if there are a lot of other four and one, five and zero oh teams that have more gaudy numbers than BYU. But four and one's four and one. You've done the right. things it takes to win a game. Greg, tell us, talk to us about like the special teams aspect, because I feel like special teams this season yeah. has been phenomenal. Yeah. And so if you're to compare BYU and TCU, where BYU actually has the advantage over TCU is is in net points per drive and net field position. Um, TCU is doing more. They're going up and down the field more. They're gaining more yards, but they're not scoring a ton more points than BYU. BYU is winning the field position battle, and they're winning their net points per drive. They're making their drives count. Ryan Rico is a big part yeah. of, of the field position swing, but it can't be only that. The reason I love field position stats is because they reflect all three sides of the game. Yeah. It's really the one stat that, that reflects all three aspects, special teams, offense, and defense. They all combine to create average starting field position. And when BYU has the advantage there, they almost always win. And this year, they're 4-0 when they win it, and they're 0-1 when they didn't, similar to the turnover number. Mm-hmm. So um, I, it, it's been a great thing for BYU. Ryan Rico is a weapon. That, that's something we cannot overlook enough is that uh, he is a weapon for this team and helps them win that category um, more often than not. And Marcus McKenzie, who Hema alludes to mm-hmm. earlier, is a big part of that too, having someone that can keep returns to a minimum. Um, so I love the stat, and it's an area that BYU has an advantage over TCU in this game. All right, our next buy or sell. BYU has over 100 rushing yards against TCU. Hema, are you buying it or selling it? I'm gonna sell this one. Okay. I mean, at least for the time being. Okay. It's it's just again, I'm not a stats guy. It's just from what I'm seeing. I'm hoping. My hope is that 
in this bye week, we were able to shore up some things, whether it's blocking scheme, whether it's cutting down the plays in the playbook, or maybe, you know, Fessy and A-Rod scheming up new, you know, um, behind the line of scrimmage throws that we can get to our running backs, whatever, whatever it is. Until they can show that they can get to 100 rushing yards, um, until then, I'll, I'll sell it. Greg, what do you think? Uh, TCU is averaging about a buck twenty-five a game on the ground right now, but BYU is averaging less than, or averaging about half of that. Uh, only Hawaii, I think, uh, runs for fewer yards per game than BYU <laughs> right now. I think BYU is around sixty-two point eight, something like that. Um, now there are seven games left in the season, but they are pacing to have the lowest. Uh, rushing totals for a BYU team ever. Now, we shouldn't say that because it's 5 of 12 games, 5 of 13. A lot can happen. It's still relatively early in the – although it feels like it's getting late, it's still only five games in, more than half the season's to be played. Um, But the numbers right now would be historically low if they stay. But I would not be surprised if things don't look a little different against TCU on Saturday. And we have to wait to see what we see, but I think some things will have to look a little different. I think they have to have looked at what's happened in five games and said, this won't work. Um, we can't keep doing 60 yards a game in the Big 12 and expect to have the season we want. Mm-hmm. So I think something has to change there. Um, I think the, the fact that Miles Davis is now part of the mix, mm. the fact that Aiden Robbins is expected to get back in the yeah. mix, should all help BYU moving ahead. And the fact that L.J. Martin truly has... Um, come to the forefront now as uh, as a back you can you can have be your guy. Uh, scored, scored two touchdowns last game. He's got five touchdowns already. Um, yeah, I, I think I think the signs are pointing up. Um, they can't go much the other way. So um, I, I think we'll see them. No, I think we'll see them improve. They have to, yeah. right? Yeah, they right. do. And, and they That's have to have looked do. at it and said, guys, we've got to figure some things out. And I think the bye week came at a really good time to maybe reset some things. And again, I'll be surprised if things don't look a little different. And we'll be able to see those ways when we see them on Saturday. Yeah, because 100 yards is not that much. 100 yards rushing, that's not. No, not you're, a, a, you're, you're, you're a lower tier team at 100 yards. Yes, yes yeah. exactly. Yeah. So BYU is 129th in rush offense. TCU's defense, however, allowed 416 yards in their last two losses. Rush yards. Yeah. So maybe BYU can capitalize on that. You mentioned some guys back from injury, and they can make it happen. I think they can. And they ha- yes, and they have to do it. I think especially against TCU because of how good they are in, in pass defense. Um, I gave you the number a short time ago. Uh, they've allowed eight offensive touchdowns in the last five games. They've allowed one touchdown pass in the last mm. five games. It's tough to do it through the air yeah. against this secondary, and so you you pretty much better be able to run it. Ooh. All right, here we go. The last one is the Big 12 will have a team in the college football playoff come the end of the season. Hema, what do you think? Buying it or selling it? I'm going to sell mm. this one. Um, I think I think we're seeing that the Big 12 has more parity than we um, thought at yeah. the beginning of mm-hmm. the season. Um, and we're seeing from the other Power 5 leagues that they have more strong teams than we thought at the beginning of the season. Um, mainly talking Pac-12, yeah, and uh, probably SEC. Um, so I'm gonna sell it for the for the Big 12. Okay, Greg, what do you think? TCU got to the playoff off a loss in the Big 12 title game last year. So that, that, that kind of that kind of to me is like the big caveat in this whole thing. It's like you're saying, well, let's say Oklahoma runs the table, but then loses. Um, let's say it's the Texas in the Big 12 championship game. Um, if Texas, if that's if the, if the OU game is Texas's only loss, and they beat OU a second time, is that enough to get them in? Mm. If OU loses to Texas, but it's the only loss of the season, is that enough to get them in? You can use TCU as the example. Yeah. So I think OU and UT can both uh, perhaps reasonably think that if their only other loss is to Texas if you're OU or to OU if you're UT, that either one can say we got a shot. Yeah, and I think they are... I think uh, Oklahoma is fifth right now in the AP pool, and I, Texas is seventh or something like that so i mean they're close Mm -hmm. they're really close but but it'll it'll take somebody running the table rest of the regular season i think either ou or ut to get that title game in in arlington to have a shot yeah and i think i agree with him that there there's a lot of parity in the big 12 right now and after the top two right yeah yes after the top two two. but when you have a big target on your back but i'm not saying you can't do it because i mean alabama has a target on their back every year but Mm -hmm. yet they still do very very well but i think i think byu is going to be one of those teams I think there's going to be a team that's going to kind of crush their hopes, <clears throat> meaning Texas and Oklahoma, of making it to the college football playoffs. So I'm going to sell it. I hope I'm wrong. 
I would love someone from the Big 12 mm-hmm. to make it in the college football playoffs just for the conference's sake. But I guess we'll see what happens. We're going to do one more, actually. And if I could just say, if it, yeah. if it were OU or UT, you know, the fl- downside of it is neither one is with you next right. year. Yeah. They're, both, yes. they're both practically totally. SEC teams at this point. Yeah, you're right. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I think for it to really matter from a Big 12 standpoint, it would have to be one of the other yeah. teams, and that'll be tough to do at this point. Kansas look good at the Jalen Daniels thing. It just doesn't look like he's going to have a fully no. healthy season. Um, and, and they're right there, they're, but they're part of that next tier. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think OU and UT are starting to look like they're pull-away teams right now. Well, now I hope they lose. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Going to the SEC, they're already yeah. part of the Big 12 next year. All right, the last buy or sell. Is Zach Wilson a legit starter in the NFL from what you've seen in these last few weeks, Greg, are you buying it or selling it? I'm buying it, but not just the last few weeks. I, I think it's because uh, some pretty smart people in that building uh, saw a number two overall pick three years ago. Yeah. Um, and that didn't mean that he was going to be the guy immediately, but they wanted to make him the guy and that immediately, and that was the mistake. He, yeah. he needed time to mature, and that's why the Aaron Rodgers plan was going to be so great for him. Right. Um, we weren't going to have to deal with this for another two years, probably. And then when those two years came along, he would have had the ripening and the maturing and everything he needed to to succeed. Unfortunately, it's been accelerated again. In year one, they threw him right in, and now in year three, they're doing it over, all over again, but by necessity. But all that being said, he's got, I think, what it takes eventually mm-hmm. to, to be uh, a good starter in the NFL. There are so many quarterbacks in the National Football League that have hung on for so long, and you don't know their and some of them don't even know their names. Yeah, Zach's true. not one of those guys. He's got exceptional talent, and and it's just been uh, too much too soon for him, uh, but he's starting to settle in now and see. Um, I, I think starting to show what he can what he can really do. What do you think, Kevin? Yeah, I'm buying it as well. I think Zach's a special talent. I think um, it's just the nature of him going to a New York market. Very, he's going to get scrutinized, you know, when he makes mistakes. Uh, uh, an organization that just retooled before he came there, um, so they are trying to figure out what to do. Um, bringing in Aaron Rodgers was a was a was a great thing for for Zach Wilson, and then the injury bug is just um, yeah, again though because like he lost Elijah Vera Tucker, one of his linemen, and it's just it's a tough it's a tough hill for for Zach. But he personally, if we're just talking Zach, he's got all the tools, he's yeah. got all the talent. It's just he's in a tough place. And I don't and, know how you do that mentally. Yeah. <laughs> like I just put myself in Zach Wilson's position and you just got everyone turning on you that's got to be so difficult but when you see him make some of those throws man you're like oh those are elite throws like those are it'll be a great story when all said and done because we'll look back at those early years the wrong things he said the the the, the mistakes he made (laughs) um the times he got beat up uh but the team will get better around him garrett wilson's going to be huge for him i mean if you can just find 17 as much as you can you're going to be in great shape uh, and, and just give that guy enough time, he can make plays. And he's athletic enough. We've already seen it. It pops up where he's athletic enough to really do things on his own, too. I think in the end, it's going to be a great story. And unfortunately, again, we, we've had to skip a few chapters because of the Aaron Rodgers injury. And that really was going to be – that was a stroke of genius. I yeah. really yes. – I thought that was going to be the thing that made Zach what he needed to be. Even even with Aaron Rodgers injured, like you can already There's see There's still an that, impact. You can see the impact. Like, you know, Zach's checking things on the line. He's making the quick – you know, two, someone was clocking every throw was like two seconds. Seconds, which is exactly an Aaron Rodgers thing, right? Instead of holding the ball, you can already see the effect happening. And I agree with you, Greg. I think give it time, Zach's going to be a phenomenal player, whether it's you know, at the Jets or somewhere else or whatever. Like Pat- I think, yeah, Patrick Mahomes. I mean, I mean, a lot of people do forget as as high a draft pick as he was, and as amazing a quarterback as he was going to be. Andy Reid sat him for a year. And you yeah. let him watch behind Alex Smith. Yeah. Now, it was a shorter process. It wasn't like you were going to have you know, three years and bring in an Aaron Rock. It was a different deal. But the point was, as amazing as Patrick Mahomes is, and could he have been the starter from day one? Absolutely, he could have been. But they wanted to let him watch a guy that had been in the league a long, long time, learn from him, and then get himself ready. And, and that was the perfect plan for Kansas City. And Mahomes is Mahomes. But that first year was still Alex Smith's show. Right. And Zach Wilson has a great father, as we know, but it seems like Aaron Rodgers has kind of taken over the football father figure role for Zach Wilson, even in the media, even recently mentioning, like, I love that kid. I want him to do well. And maybe that's the mother in me, but I'm like, (laughs) oh, that's so No, it was great to see. He's still coaching him up. Again, he's like Hema said, it's still going to help him, even though Aaron's not out there playing. um, Zach will still benefit. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to talk about Cougs in the news. This is Cougar Tailgate.
Welcome back to Cougar Tailgate. I'm Lauren McLean with Greg Rebell and Hema Hemuli. All right, guys, let's talk about Cougs in the news. This is kind of a weird one. I'm not sure if you all saw this, but I'm sure you did. Uh, one of the top posts in college football subreddit said, BYU is a vampire team confirmed. Since 2020, BYU is 21-0 in games without sunlight and 12-10 and in games with sunlight. Some of the comments are, Twilight was written by a BYU alum, so... Like I <laughs> okay. Well, first sure. of all, the yeah. the the, the twenty one zero number is wrong. Oh, it's not accurate. Um, Get him, Greg. Everything yeah. everything on Reddit's correct. No, isn't it? remember they oh, lost okay. to ECU at night last year. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So anyway, the, the the number's wrong. It's <laughs> it's not too far off. I did the I did I broke it down recently. I think it's nineteen and one. Their last twenty something. Like that. Either way, uh, <laughs> they're not twenty one zero, but they do much better at night lately than they have in the daytime. It's just a funny thing. Yeah. Again, Eric, uh, Jay, Jay Hill talked about. It. He goes, he, you know, they put no stock in it, but the coaches are aware of it, and there are some things. I mean. BYU's clearly got a winning formula, especially yeah. for home. Like when it's a late game, eight yes. o'clock, they know how to handle their day and get ready to go at night. They just do. Um, and sometimes early games uh, can be funky if you're if you're not used to playing them, especially if you're on the road and you've got a say a long bus ride to the game and it's early. Guys falling asleep on the bus. It's it, yeah. They can they can mess with you. So if you're used to doing one thing a lot, and I would say BYU plays more night games than day games. Yes. Um, there's good, yeah, yeah, it can be a factor. Yeah, but it also makes sense too, considering BYU's players are also a million years old, just like vampires are. They're <laughs> thousands of years old, so <laughs> it tracks. By the way, TCU's got a 30 year old punter this week. Hey, what's their average age on yeah. their he team? Brings I want to know that. He, and, and, and how about this? He's only the fifth oldest player in college football. He's 30, and none of the guys are BYU guys. Oh, there come you go. On. <laughs> there it is. All right, Fred Warner with a dominant performance against the Dallas Cowboys Sunday night. Eight tackles, forced fumble, interception. We're biased really quickly, though. Is he the best linebacker in the NFL, Emma? Absolutely. Yeah. He's, he's hands down. You can't look at him eye test and say that he's not. He's incredible. And I think every other defensive player and offensive player in the NFL yes. would say the same thing right now. That's yeah. what's so awesome is everybody agrees with him. He's it. a he's BYU so guy. Dominant. We brought up on the coach show last night, but think mm-hmm. about it. Who are the two guys making the most waves right now in the NFL on offense and defense? Defense, it's Fred. And Puka offense Nakua. is Puka Nakua. Both yeah. BYU guys. How great is oh, this? It's so awesome. Beautiful. And that's what uh, I watch Puka Nakua and I'm like, what could have been? I know he had injuries at BYU, and BYU tried to use him as much as possible. He did so many different things. But and I'm wouldn't like, it be ironic if, it, if his first healthy, truly healthy season comes in a 17 game NFL season when he sets all kinds of records? Oh my God. I know. Yeah. I love it. All right, guys. Thanks so much for coming on. That does it for us today. Thanks again to Greg Rebell and Hema Hemuli for coming on the show with me. Carter Bond and Tori Kimball helped produce this episode with senior producer Cleon Wall. You can join the Cougar Tailgate wherever you get your podcasts on Apple, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify, or on BYUradio.org. Cougar Tailgate is a production of BYU Radio.